half in the bag. This virus is that insidious. Oh God, don't let it touch me. It's fine. It doesn't live on aluminum for very long. You just need to make sure your fucking disgusting mouth is six feet away from my fucking disgusting mouth. You know how many filthy things I've said over the years? Are we six feet apart? Yes, Jesus we're six Christ. feet. I go six feet two inches just to be safe, even though it's not currently recommended by the CDC. But this is... <sighs> well, Jay, it's April 15th, the official peak of the pandemic. We lost so many people in the entertainment industry. And I can't believe those celebrities in the Imagine video all got COVID-19. Oh, uh, I know. But that second video they made, where they were all singing We Are The World into their ventilators, Oh, that was so cringy. I mean, come on. There's so many useless old people out there that need those ventilators. And I can't believe we lost Betty White, too. What? We lost her inside her mansion. I mean, she's perfectly healthy. They just don't know what room she's in because she's got a big house. Yeah, they can't find her. They, they can't find her, her. Yeah, yeah. yeah. My bet is on the crafting room in the basement. Yeah, yeah, she loves crafting. <laughs> she loves her crafts. <laughs> oh, uh, and did you hear Brian Singer also got COVID-19. Not Brian. Yeah, although he was a little disappointed. He was hoping for COVID-17 or maybe COVID-16, as long as it keeps its fucking mouth shut. And it was such a shame when that mob of infected homeless people stormed Kim Kardashian's house and burned... Oh. Who is it? Are you expecting someone? No, are you? Fuck no. I guess it's my turn, right? Who is it? Postal service, got a package. Just leave it outside the fucking door! No, uh, you've got a sign for it. Sign for it? Are you fucking kidding me? Just slide it under the door! Or I'll pump your belly full of coronavirus, I mean lead! I'll pump your belly full of lead! Why are you still delivering packages anyways? You got a death wish? <laughs> Just a minute, Jake. You gotta do the process, you know? All right, now it's time to open the package. So what'd you get in the mail? Oh, I finally got Veronica on Blu-ray. Oh, yeah, that. It's streaming on Amazon. What? <sighs> Fuck physical media. Glenn Danzig's directorial debut is a horror anthology that compiles stories from Danzig's line of comic books of the same name, 
Stories which focus on horror content that's often sexual and violent in nature, usually featuring scantily clad female protagonists. And it sucks! Why, Mike, what are you drinking? Uh, YJ. <laughs> I'm drinking Zombie Dust by Three Floyds. This is not a paid sponsorship. We just happened to have it and it's good. And it seemed appropriate. It seemed appropriate in this apocalyptic times we're living in. It's called Zombie. And I think uh, Glenn Danzig probably saw the films that Rob Zombie was doing and was like, I could do that too. But much, much, much worse. That's right, Jay. <laughs> so today we're talking about Verotica. You know what's weird? They, they say it's, it's based on a line of comic books that he made, but the comic book is called Verotic, which is still the same idea. They combine the word violence with erotic, but we changed it from Verotic to Verotica for the film because that's the kind of nonsensical, pointless, uh, creative decision that goes right along with the rest of the movie. Uh, this was a movie that we've heard about, legends, stories, myths, <laughs> about this movie that uh, was only available, to, to the only way to see it was if you went to a screening of it. Yeah. I don't know if it, it played at some festivals, they're listed on the The, the first box. one was in Chicago, there was this thing called like Cinepocalypse, yeah. and that was the one where the next day people were writing articles like, this is the new The Room. Right. Uh, which I disagree with, but we'll get into it. Um, but it's still a fascinating, fascinating movie. Oh God. Save the alcohol. And the guns. It's Patton Oswalt's whiskey. <laughs> Somehow I don't think he'll be back for it. <laughs> um, but yeah, we, we heard about it. Glenn Danzig made a movie. And, and if you don't know who Glenn Danzig is, probably don't. He's a legendary musician if yeah, you're into music. People over 40 might know who yeah. Glenn Danzig is. He's an old man now, but he, he used to make rock and roll music. His most famous song is Mother. 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 Uh, you know, yeah, yeah, moderately successful rock and roll guy with enough clout in his name to reel in a whole school bus filled with porn stars to be in his film. <laughs> um, I intentionally used school bus and porn star as opposing imagery for comedic effect. Yes, I get it. I get it. Had I said party bus or limousine, it wouldn't have been as funny. You, wait, you put thought into that joke. I did. Yeah. It's good to put thought into your, your creative uh, ideas. Yeah, someone should tell Pete Davidson that. <laughs> so, Jay, what is the plot of Verotica? Uh, well, Glenn Danzig uh, uh, watched the movie Black Sabbath by Mario Bava. <laughs> and said, I'm gonna do that. Horror anthology. He didn't have three, it's three stories, but he didn't have stories, he just had an idea. He had three ideas, and and that's as far as it got. Yeah. The first story, uh, uh, Spider-Man, uh, when, when a lady falls asleep, her id is the Spider-Man that snaps next. Uh, no! Yeah. Second story is uh, strippers, and then the third story is a woman bathes in blood. And that's it. So to encapsulate everything real quick here, there's three vignettes. The first two were, were funny bad. Who is it? I'm in here. I didn't call maintenance today. And then uh, the third one I thought would, you know, crescendo. Ramp, crescendo the whole experience into one powerfully bad, bad movie. Uh, but it was a real letdown on the third story, mm -hmm. unfortunately. Which is sort of interesting in its own right when we get to it. Yeah, it was the most technically competent of the three, uh, but it was the least funny. Because mm -hmm. um, we're going to talk about technical competence. Uh, the film is 
replete <laughs> with technical errors uh, that are so glaring, it's shocking. Yeah. Uh, Glenn Danzig is, is credited as the writer and director. And cinematographer. Uh, also the DP with somebody else. Mm -hmm. And uh, on the Blu-ray, the, there's the movie, but there's also like a, you know, a bunch of behind the scenes photos hmm. where like this movie, it looks like uh, like a B movie made by like a high school kid. It looks like a porno. Mahia, it happened again. And it was all going so well. I mean, when it starts, yeah. you have you have the intro bit because we have like our own like Crypt Keeper type character, yes, named like Booberella or whatever it is, and uh, the movie starts with her gouging someone's eyes out, yeah, which right. I think is a, a Fulci influence because Lucio Fulci likes uh, eye trauma, and uh, naturally, when your eyes get plucked out of your head by a porn star, you just go, my eyes, my eyes. <laughs> But then she turns to the camera and starts talking to the camera, and it's incredibly jarring and awkward. Yeah, she's your uh, your crypt keeper. Yeah. Just not as punny. Welcome, my darklings. My name is Morella, and this is Veronica. The whole movie is that people standing there awkwardly. Nobody knows what to do. It's the, the feature-length equivalent of the scene in Samurai Cop in the uh, police chief's office where he yells at Samurai Cop and Frank and they leave the room and then the camera just holds on him and the actor didn't know what to do. Come back here, you motherfucker! And he just sort of sits down and he's waiting for him to yell cut. They don't yell cut. And he's just trying to come up with shtick. He starts laughing. And we multiple times when we were watching this movie, we were like, and cut. And he just never cuts. Fuck off. Um, but on, in those behind the scenes stills, we're like, I mean, the production quality, we say this a lot, looks as bad as Space Cop. Yeah. And we shot Space Cop on a crappy, the AF-100, right? Without right. like any gear or yeah. anything. No any, good lenses. No good lenses. And then you see some of the behind, behind the scenes stills and I don't know what they're shooting it on. It's a big old camera with lots of big lenses and and it, it, it just looks like garbage. <laughs> uh, it just looks so bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a clean image. It's in focus, <laughs> but uh, it, it's, the director of photography is as bad as, as Jay Bauman. It's it's light out of frame, just pointed right at everybody, harsh shadows. Yeah. The camera work, just constantly zooming in and out for no reason. It was making me think of early John Waters movies, mm. but there's more motivation for the, the awkward zooms in those. Cause it's like characters talking, zoom in on them. Yeah. They're finishing talking, zoom out, zoom back in on another character. But in this movie, it just like randomly zooming in and out. There's a girl walking like down the street and, and the lady says, I'm here to take your face. Your face, it's very nice. Give it to me. <laughs> it's amazing acting. She's like, dialogue. My, my face? What do you want with my face? Well, no, you can't have my... Not my face, don't take my face. <laughs> and then, um. Then they do like this super long snap zoom mm -hmm. on the girl who's going to take her face, the, the mystery woman. The mystery woman, and uh, all the zooming kind of made me think he was trying to do like a grindhousey 1970s horror grindhouse kind of thing. Yeah, things like uh, that when it's motivated, like snap yeah. zoom on the villain. But there's so many scenes where it just completely inexplicably is zooming in and out. I wonder if. Glenn Danzig himself is operating the camera, and he's just kind of like, like your, you know, your 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 Uncle Bob with his VHS camera, <laughs> yeah. you know, filming the family party in the backyard, like kind of. Uh, uh, uh. Most of his footage is just of his feet, right? Because he doesn't know what's, what he's doing. That's what it kind of feels like. It's yeah. just like a guy who was given the camera, who doesn't have a lot of experience with what to film, because mm -hmm. there is there's that part in the third vignette when uh, I think she kills. 
a girl or brings the girl to the blood puddle mm -hmm. and then they're like oh we gotta dump this body the girl's dead now and and then the camera like oh, <laughs> oh you know what am i what am i following here yeah. and then it's like kind of like floats around and it's just like someone is operating it going what is the focus of this scene no one's telling me yeah uh it's, it's quite amazing actually the technical problems i mean i think we wrote we wrote some of these down <laughs> early on in the first two there's um a location which appears to be some kind of brick warehouse uh, that they've built sets inside of, which are like apartment sets. Yeah. There's uh, several low angle shots where you can see the top <laughs> of the walls and some kind of piece of plywood they put up there to simulate a ceiling. Yeah. Um, then they go outside of the building to try to recreate an alleyway. In France. In the first France. segment inexplicably takes place in France. Yes. And, um, uh, and those porn stars are not good with French accents. Half the time you don't understand what they're saying. Can't you see she's not feeling well? I think she's still in shock. Yes. Imagine you found your best friend dead. Yeah. Oh, everybody's bad at their French accent. With no leads to go on, police are still hoping. The police are calling this murderer Lena Brecker. The men are worse than the porn stars. <laughs> that, that's that waiter in the cafe. Oh Ooh. my God. Then may I suggest that one girl stay at home? For somewhere out there is the neck breaker. Uh, but you see the police bust down a door with one of those like cop door busting things. Yeah, but they do it very lightly into the door. Yeah. Let's go. Uh, uh, and then it, they cut to the reverse and you see the scoring on the door of where it's supposed to burst through. Yep. Uh, there's a part where in the third one where the, the, the blood bath lady is walking down at like a hill and off to the right of the frame you see, uh, you can see the crew. Yep with the lights and you see like the blinky lights of like the video village or whatever they have over there. And it's just like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, like you see the lights. Uh, I mean, you, you could tell where the light is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Unmotivated. That part where, yeah, there's like that wide shot of her walking through the woods. And yeah, it's directly behind a tree. Uh, there's a part in the first story where uh, our, our porn star number one goes into a movie theater and it's a tiny little screening room, but they apparently didn't have a projector light. So it's just a light with a fan in front of it spinning. And you just see the fan. They're trying to create that flickery light from a, from a film projector, but you just see the fan. Yeah. It's like you, the, the, the fan idea wasn't bad. No, when it pans down and you don't see it, it's like, okay, that's yeah, it kind of works as, you know, like when, when you make like a, like a fire effect or fireplace campfire or whatever, yeah. you kind of like, you know, you wave some gels in front of a light. Sure. You can kind of pull it off, but you don't show someone waving the gels in front of the light. <laughs> I think maybe Glenn Danzig thought, hey, there's a fan up there because it's hot in the projection room. And then it also uh, makes a flickering effect. Does Glenn Danzig sound like Sylvester Stallone? I had never heard Glenn Danzig speak, mm. so I'm imagining he sounds like Rocky. Okay, that's fair. And there's a fan up there, so the, the flickering effect, it's, it's fine. <laughs> if you told me this movie was directed by the fictional character Rocky Balboa, I would believe you. He did get brain damage in Rocky V. Yeah. So. After Rocky V, Rocky Balboa. <laughs> yes. After, he's been punched in the head 10,000 <laughs> times. Um. <laughs> My face? What do you want with my face? Uh, and then an another amazing uh, uh, flub, I think, is uh, <laughs> one of our, I don't know, uh, porn stars. I think, I think they're all porn stars, I don't know. Um, she's wearing a tight, like, bodysuit kind of dress. Oh, yeah. And uh, she has, like, a dog collar thing. And she's wearing a mic pack, but they didn't have anywhere they could hide the mic pack. So they taped it to her thigh, which isn't visible probably in most shots that they do. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, they get this super low angle of her walking up the stairs where the mic pack is visible. Nobody thought to, back to of move her it. Thigh. Yeah, you don't just, need her audio for that shot anyway. Just take it off. Yeah, yeah. She just had it on all day long. Yeah. 
I, I would love to hear from someone who worked on this as a crew member. Yeah. And it's just like, yeah, Glenn, Dad, Glenn Danzig was a big prick, so we just <laughs> fucking didn't give a shit. Or, you know, supreme levels of incompetence. Yeah. The from movie almost every feels aspect. like an intentional joke. Like, but that's the whole thing with Danzig, I guess, is that he's not self aware at how silly he kind of is. This movie is like the, the cinematic equivalent of that picture of him carrying the kitty litter. If you've ever seen that, where he has this like imposing, you know, rock and roller image, but he's just got a giant uh, container of kitty litter. That, Jay, the lack of self-awareness is the key ingredient in, in the cake batter of a bad, <laughs> so bad it's good movie, is the, is the director is oblivious yeah. uh, that they are making something bad and they are passionate about about making um, something serious and good and telling an artistic vision. You're Tommy Wiseau's, you know, like. Trey, shut up! It's cool. It's shut over. up! It's over! It's not over. Everybody betrayed me. I fed up with his world. Glenn Danzig kind of looks like Tommy Wiseau. They, they look Long black they hair. They yeah. should uh, collaborate on yeah. a project. Yeah. Uh, you're, yeah, you're, uh, you're Neil Breen's, you're uh, John DeHart. I mean. <laughs> That is that is the key ingredient. Yeah. And vanity. Less so with this, because Glenn, Glenn Danzig isn't in the movie, which is surprising. But it still has that, uh, you're just picturing him behind the camera being like, this is going to be so fucking awesome, so metal. Well, uh, okay, let's go segment by segment. All right. First segment is called Something About an Albino Spider. Yeah. Uh, and then it's the weirdness starts off right out of the gate. We have a lady with a pink wig on going down on a guy. With his pants still on. With his pants still on. <laughs> uh, and uh, they get start getting hot and heavy and he wants to take her top off and she says no. This goes on for 15 minutes. This goes on a little too long. And then um, he finally does, uh, against her wishes, get her top off. And we discover her boobs have nipple eyes. <laughs> Your teeth, they're looking at me. Don't look. I don't know how to, well, how to say that. Well, they're just eyes. Her, her nipples should be their eyes. Where and we have to explain this because I don't think we can show it. We'll do our best. YouTube will, will do everything in its power to stop us, but we're going to try <laughs> to show you as much of this movie as we can. Um, uh, her boobs have eyes where the nipples are. Yeah. And then that freaks the guy out, and then she cries, and also her boob eyes cry. And the boob eye sheds a tear yeah. onto a robotic white spider. That is uh, across the room, but yet somehow the tear falls straight down and lands on the spider that's over there somewhere. Yeah. Well, it felt like an unfinished effect. It looked like the, uh, like the animatic or whatever before an effect is finished, where it's just like grayscale and you haven't added the texture to it. That's the discount like CGI. Yeah. Like he went to a CGI company and they're like, yeah, you want a realistic looking spider? It's gonna cost you, and then he goes, "How about, how about the, the animatic? That looks good. The wireframe model. It's good enough. Uh, uh, I could, I could put some, some skin on that wireframe model. Uh, uh, Hundred fifty dollars more. No. Uh, all right. <laughs> Here. So then this spider, because of the boob tear, turns into a giant man spider. <laughs> yes. Uh." which kind of looks like, like a comic book villain. I could, I could very much so picture that as a drawing in a comic book. The, the makeup isn't too terrible. It's not too, it, it's, that's, the, that's, that's where the, the failure of the director and the DP comes in because the makeup doesn't look bad. Um, the, the, the six arms look bad. Well, yeah, yeah. Two real arms and then Four like rubbly arms that just dangle there. They don't even try to make a move. They don't They're even just constantly to... like this. Yeah, so it's like, okay, you're doing a spider thing, sure. What, you, you ever see the? You ever, you ever see those guys that that have like, like five or six puppets, and then they have it all. They're all like synced up. Sure. You could have done something like that where you raise your arm up, and and in the background it connects all. So you could go like this, brand the yeah. spider, and then you see a. But they're just like completely <laughs> lifeless arms. Um, and then you see this creature and it's in the distance. And if you soft focus it, 
light it moodily with some smoke in front of it. It looks very creepy, mm -hmm. but then they get these extreme close-ups. Yeah, with just these harsh front lights on it. Yeah. yeah. You can and see like the, the line where the like neck piece meets yeah. the chest piece. And it's like, oh, this is high definition video. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, oh. This isn't 16 millimeter in the 1970s. Right. <laughs> uh, but this story is very simple. The, the Spider-Man, We'll call him the Spider-Man. Kills her roommate. Or her, uh, it's someone else that just lives in her apartment. We're yeah. not really sure. It doesn't matter. Well, that leads to one of the best lines in the movie, though, when the neighbor or roommate or whoever it is is looking in the fridge deciding what beverage she wants. Milk or beer? Milk or beer? <laughs> Depends which time of day it is, honey. <laughs> Uh, so but the idea is that when she falls asleep, that's when the Spider-Man can attack people. Right. Just sleep, Dashat. Then I will go. I will go do the things that you imprison in your mind. I will flee what the erotic water Dashat has bound inside her soul. And then she learns on the news from a man who's hiding his face. The microphone or out his of mouth? shame. Out of shame. <laughs> this is the best my agent could get me. <laughs> Should have worked my shift at Panera Bread instead. Um, uh, he, he, sa he says this lady got killed. Oh no, he talks about the hooker that got killed. Yeah, first the roommate gets killed. He yeah. snaps her neck. Yeah. For some reason that's his technique for killing because then he approaches the prostitute in the alley in France and, and well first he says he wants to fuck her in the ass. I'm sure I can accommodate his tests. First, I wish to pinch you over right here and fuck you in the ass. That, she yes. says, ass fucking is my, spe ass fuck is my specialty. Ass fuck is my specialty. And then he snaps her neck. I want to hear your neck. No! Does the news call him like the neck breaker or yes. something? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then when the second murder comes around, that's when she says, Oh my gosh, the. Oh, okay. I don't know how to do a French accent. The neck breaker. He is in my dreams. She somehow makes a connection that this, this spider creature is killing the, killing the prostitutes or porn stars or whatever's happening. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, oh, uh, and then the cops show up. Well, first she goes to the movies. She goes to a porno. That's where we get the famous fan scene. Right. Uh, the other, she falls asleep in the theater immediately and the other people try to rape her. And then she wakes up and realizes what's happening and very slowly leaves the room. Um, and then she goes to a cafe, the famous cafe scene. Yes. Which is inexplicable. This is like the, the hi doggy scene from the room. Yeah. Hi doggy, you're my favorite customer. Thanks a lot, bye. Bye bye. Where, where everything is just wrong and it's very, very quick. She comes into the cafe. There's a coffee sitting there for her already. Yep. The waiter comes up and, and I think the purpose of the scene was to warn her about the neck breaker. Because he says something that goes, be careful, the neck, don't walk home alone, the neck breaker's there. Like, yeah, well, he asked, first he, he asked if she wants a refill. We are closing. Would you like another refill? Yes. She just walked in. From someone else's coffee. Someone else's coffee that was already on the table? I don't know. No, I'm leaving. And then, yeah, uh, she then pays for the coffee before she leaves, even though she didn't have any. <laughs> Um, that's when he warns her about the neck breaker and she learns about it that way. Yeah. And she ends up back at her apartment. The cops show up for some reason. It's a little fuzzy at this point. Forever. What have you done? You idiot! No, 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 this cannot be happening! Not now! Uh, and then they, they oh, she, she tries to OD on pills. Yeah. She tries to kill herself with sleeping pills, presumably, so that the neck breaker can't be released. So he can't break no more necks. He can't break no more necks. And then, then the cops shoot him like a hundred times and then it ends. Yes. I was going to pose this as a question, but I'm just going to make it a statement. 
Glenn Danzig is a huge pervert. <laughs> I was gonna say, do you think? Yeah, Glenn, well, yeah. And, and then I thought. That's a part of the rock and roll lifestyle, Mike. Uh, I mean. Nothing, music and porn stars, that's all, that's all there is. If the movie had some sort of artistry to it, you could say, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's about sex and violence. It's about sexuality and the, the, the interlinking between that and violence. And, yeah. But it's, it's just strippers. But our second story, uh, strippers. Yes, it's called Change of Face. And this makes no fucking sense. <laughs> I mean, it does on a very surface level, but when you really think about it, 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 it makes no sense. Yes. Uh, the story is... The premise is, there's no story. Premise is Glenn Danzig had access to a strip club. Mm-hmm for two days. I was gonna say two hours. <laughs> two hours, two days, whatever. Um, and it was like a real location. Him and his crew got to film ladies walking around and spinning on poles for, for a day and a half. And then he had to slap a story on top of that. I think that's what happened uh, because, oh, we open with an alleyway or a nighttime street scene. And there's a lady walking, brilliant actress. Very good. Uh, and then <laughs> a mysterious lady comes out of the darkness and says, I want to take your face off. I'm going to cut your face off. She's like, no, not my face. I need my face. Uh, she says, don't resist me. I'm cutting. And then it, there's no struggle. There's no attempt at, at her defending herself. It just cuts to her like laying on the ground. Yep. If you aren't going to give it to me, then I'll guess I've just had to take it from you. Now look what you made me do. And then peels it off. And uh, this lady who is called Mystery Woman. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, coming to the stage, get ready for the Mystery Girl. Uh, takes faces of other ladies and nails them to the wall of her dressing room at the backstage of the strip club. I think that's at her house or her apartment. Okay. I think that's separate from the strip club. Uh, but she is a, a stripper mm -hmm. who has like a, a, a scarred face. Uh, Did they explain where the scars came no. from? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Your brain just broke. She, okay. she cuts off faces to put over her scarred face, but the other faces that she puts on her, All just when like she puts face. them on, just look like her face. Uh, but then when she strips, she's got her face covered anyway. That's, that's <laughs> the part that, that gets me. <laughs> it's like, okay, I get it, right? Okay, say the lady was a stripper and she was, she was very successful at her job, right? She, uh, 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 she, she made a lot of money, she was re really good at her job, and then someone throws acid in her face. And because of this horrifying incident, she says, I can't be a stripper anymore with a fucked up face. So she cuts the faces off other women, puts it on, makes it perfect, goes full Mrs. Doubtfire, <laughs> and makes, makes a pretty face that she can now continue her work as a stripper. The cops are slowly moving in to catch her. Yeah. Uh, who keeps cutting out? Because the face will rot off eventually. So you gotta replace it and get a new one. one it's almost like a vampire having to yeah. feed on blood to, to keep themselves alive. That makes sense. Yes. Uh, but she strips with another face on her face, but covers that face with a mask, with a <laughs> veil. Yep. <laughs> Dead skin mask that I wear. It fits so right. It makes me feel like I'm alive. Like I'm not the disfigured freak that I am. It could be like she just is crazy because of her fucked up face, so she doesn't want other women to have faces. 
See, now you're coming up with more motivation that isn't in the movie. I know. Though. There's none of this is explained. Yeah. I want to, I, I'm not, uh, my, my beauty has been ruined with these scars, so I want to steal other women's beauty. Right. There exactly. You go. Um, and uh, she wears them at night and just laughs and, and then throws them into a, her garbage disposal or something. <laughs> and then, ha ha ha. And then, and then she still has to wear the veil just to, to be a stripper because she has a, a fucked up face. Yeah. Uh, we don't even know why she's a stripper. We don't know anything about her. But let's talk about our policeman. Yes, this is the best, best stuff in the movie. Young woman, her face cut off. No apparent motive, no witnesses, no leads. This is a combination of Tommy Wiseau and Ed Wood. What do you got? What we got is grizzly, Sarge. Oh yeah? How grizzly? Pretty grizzly these scenes, the scenes with the cops. The dialogue is so terrible. It sounds like it was written by someone who's never heard a human speak before. Cause of death, apparent shock and loss of blood. Nice, another sicko killer. So the cops are there, there's, a, there's like a, obviously the homicide detective, and then there's a couple of like uniformed cops. And the uniformed cop's like, yep, uh, she got her face cut off. <laughs> And then he's like, oh my God, but where is her face? And the cop's like, I don't know. There's no fingerprints or, or nothing. So we've got no evidence. There's no case. Like, I think like, the motive is that she took her face. I, th I think what I'm trying to say is that the, the uniformed cop whose job it is to like rope off the crime scene and leave it alone so the detectives can come in and like, look, he starts like making like wild assumptions mm -hmm. and statements that are well beyond his, his level, you know what I mean? Afraid not, sir. I mean, we, we, we've got nothing. Zero evidence, which means no leads or motive. So it's like, eh, like no one under, like Glenn Danzig doesn't know how cops talk yeah. or hasn't even seen a movie. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know anything about cops, but I know like the basic. Yeah. Where's her face? Well, that's what I was gonna get to, is whoever did this just didn't, just left with it and left no, no trace, nowhere to be found. No blood trail. <sighs> Negatory. So the dialogue is, is like unbelievable and, and amateurish, and the acting is so bad. Well, our lead cop, our lead detective, he's doing our, his best like gruff the crime dog voice. Uh, I don't know why that decision was made. Like when, when, you're, when you're in seventh grade and you're playing a detective, you go, I'm a detective. But, the, but the, uh, the, the guy who's playing the cop is a grown man who probably has his normal voice, but yet he's doing the voice of a grown-up. <laughs> it's so fucking weird. Nice. Another sicko killer. Anything else for me? But that is the, the, the true treasure of this movie, is, is really, it's the acting. Yeah. Because the room, it's, it's all isolated in Tommy Wiseau's bad acting. Yeah. Everybody else, they do what they can with the weird dialogue. They do a serviceable job with, with the bad script, but and they're okay at acting. Yeah. But this, it's like everyone is a train wreck, yeah. and it's amazing to well, watch. Well, the, the, the scene after the cop scene, I think that's when she goes, uh, mystery woman goes into that woman's house, blonde lady. Yes. The blonde lady's like, who is that? Who's there? I'm here. And you're like, what are you talking about? Who is it? I'm in here. I didn't call maintenance today. <laughs> Face collector. I've come to get your face. My face, no. But that's again, that scene, uh, mystery woman goes to blonde woman's house. We don't know how she knows her. There's no setup. It's not like she followed her home. She's just there and she cuts off her face in an incredibly awkward uh, fight scene. They struggle and then it just, Hard cuts to her on the ground. Oh, too late, pretty, pretty. That looks like a horribly dangerous way to open your beer. Anyways, we're, we're still talking about Veronica. Yes, yes. 
Uh, mystery lady leaves her business card at the murder scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, why not? Dad? It, she, it, it falls out of her pockets. Hey, Sarge. What you got? It looks like a business card from a titty club or a stripper. Check it out. Falls out of her purse. Why does she have it? Why does a stripper have a business card? I want to keep those clients coming back. Okay. Okay. With your with your cell phone number on there, your email address, your website, your home address. If you're going out to murder somebody, why do you even have that on you, though? She came from work. <laughs> She's got a whole bunch of business cards in, in her cleavage or okay. wherever she keeps them. Uh, you know, come back, have a good time with me. Here's my business card. Has my real name on it too, not just my <laughs> stage name. <laughs> And my home address. I hand this out to all the patrons at the strip club. But uh, Appar apparently, in this world, that is not the the cops. They discover the business card, and that's not a clue or that's not a lead. That's the evidence, that, right. and they are now one hundred percent convinced that this woman is the killer. That is the finite conclusion. That's all it takes. It's not that this card could have been laying on the floor for weeks in this apartment or whatever. <laughs> Uh, unrelated, yeah. you know, it's not a lead. Right. A, it, it would be a lead. It would be one of 20 different things that they, they follow up on. And he's, I'm just coming here to, to, you know, ask a couple questions. So, you know, it's he goes there <laughs> to the strip club with full intent on arresting mystery woman for the murder of Lady. Yeah. The name is Sergeant Anders, fuckface. Are you gonna tell me whether she's here or not? Oh God, that scene. Well, he, he shows up and he's talking to like the door guy. And, oh yeah. And, and he's like, I'm looking for a uh, mystery woman, right? Whatever her name and is. He's like, yeah. nobody knows her name. I don't know if she's working tonight. And then another girl hears it and she runs back and uh, to, to give the heads up <laughs> of, to mystery woman. And, and oh God, well, I don't remember what she said, but it was one of those moments. There's a cop out front looking for you. He'll be down here any second. It's amazing. She goes, I'll run interference. Yeah. And then she runs in the hallway and she's like, hey, mister, you can't be back here. There's naked ladies back here. He's like, he's like, I can go wherever I want. I'm the cops. Where do you think you're going? No people allowed. There's naked girls back there. Very funny. There are naked girls out here too. It's a strip club. And then he busts into the dressing room. And I think a similar exchange happens where he's like, I'm a cop and I could go where I want. All you cops are the same. All bark when all you really want is some free sex. Wrong. Uh, and I'll shoot you all. I would love to shoot you all dead. Why? What are you gonna do? Shoot us? Oh, believe me, right about now, I'd really like to. And then, uh, so, what are you doing? Yeah. What? Well, the best is when he confronts Mystery Woman. Well, he goes into a dark, mysterious room. Mystery woman like puts him in a headlock or something. She's behind him. Yes. And then he shoots his gun forward and it hits her. Yes. Uh, and then this movie defies uh, the laws of physics. It does. Yeah. But he shoots her several times, hits her m multiple times in the abdomen, and the shoulder, and whatnot. She runs off, and he—that's when this guy has his his big acting. Oh moment. yeah. Uh, his, his the slow zoom in as he's screaming like, "I'll get you, mystery woman! You cut my fucking face, you sick goddamn cunt! Go ahead, run, mystery girl. How far you think you're gonna get with a couple of rounds in you? I'm gonna get you, you sick fuck! You hear? I'm gonna get you!" Who may or may not have done anything? Well, he found a business card he at that one a lady's business house. Card. That's that's the business card. That's <laughs> that's guaranteed. She's a murderer. That's proof. It's proof. I mean, there was also like that uh, the the takeout menu for the Italian restaurant down the street. That was on the floor, right? But he didn't go roughing up Antonio. Hey, pizza maker, you killed the lady with, you cut her face off. I throw up the dough in the air. I don't need the face. <laughs> I, 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 I found your takeout menu next to the body. Why, why are you talking Italiana? It was next to the body. You cut the face off like the pizza dough. <laughs> what do you want? Uh, 
Uh, but yeah, he has this moment where he's screaming, I'm gonna get you. He's like, he's like, you're not gonna f get very far with five bullets in you. Cut to six months later. Yeah, I think a different strip club or is it the it's same, the same strip one? Club? But she's wearing a slightly different outfit that now inexplicably shows her belly, tummy area when before it didn't. Yes. But now it does. Now and she has bullet hole scars on her belly. So what better time to start exposing your belly when you now have bullet hole scars on it? Yeah. Before when you didn't, that's when you wear the, the, the concealing gown, right? Sure. Face still covered too. The See, if you wanted to do a thing like, cause she just strips and then the segment ends. Yes. So it's like, if you wanted to do a thing where it's like she outwitted the cops by like cutting off someone else's face, wearing someone else's face so she looks like a different person now, they don't do anything, it just ends. It just, it just I know, out. I know, Jay, I know. I feel your pain. I just want things to make sense. There are so many elements in this that can be rearranged on the most basic level yeah. to form a cohesive story <laughs> of some kind, even if yeah. it's not good. But instead she was pursued by the cops, the cops shot her, and then she just continued to work at the strip club and has the bullet wounds so we know it's the same person. And then the cops, why didn't they just stop? They stopped investigating. They just gave up? They were working on, on coronavirus. Oh, okay. Crowd control, okay? <laughs> you gotta keep people in their homes. Social distancing. They gotta patrol the streets. They don't have time to worry about psychotic stripper face takers. Okay. 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 Uh, yeah, it's frustrating. <laughs> uh, but that's what makes it kind of great. It's baffling. It, uh, yeah, it's baffling. You cut my fucking face, you sick goddamn cunt! Go ahead! Run, mystery girl! How far you think you're gonna get with a couple of rounds in you? I'm gonna get you! No matter where you go! No matter where you hide! I'm gonna get you, you sick fuck! You hear? I'm gonna get you! Uh, so should we uh, segue into our, th our third and final segment? Sure. Which is called something Dracula, Countess of Blood, Contessa S of Blood? Something like that. It's Contessa of Blood, yeah. Yeah. And you said this was based on a real it's, life it's, thing? Yeah, it's very clearly based on Elizabeth Bathory, who was a, a countess, I think, in like the 1600s in like Hungary, I want to say but she would kill, torture and kill virginal women and, and bathe in their blood to, because she thought it would keep her, keep her young. How'd that work out for her? Uh, well, um, I'm assuming she died at some point. I don't know how it works out for the woman in this movie because nothing happens and then it just ends. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's literally it. Glenn Danzig heard of this legend or historical fact, whatever it may be, and said, Naked lady in a bloodbath? Fuck yeah. Oh, we'll steal some costumes from the Renaissance Fair. This segment should be called, Look, we got horses. Because he, he's really proud of having people ride horses. Yeah, a couple of horses. Yeah. Yeah, that's really it though. Uh, the, there's the first scene, she has like a lineup of women and she decides on one and kills her and bathes in her blood for like like three hours, it feels like. And then another woman comes in and they slit her throat. So then she bathes in even more blood. No, the, uh, yeah, the, they establish that the Contessa of Blood has multiple ways of acquiring virgins. Mm -hmm. um, there, there is a scene where the Contessa goes into the woods and gives a wolf some uh, uh, some meat from one of the dead ladies that that you murdered. The wolf eats the meat and, and she goes, bring me more virgins. And the wolf runs off. Uh, she sends her goons around. They, 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 one time they catch a lady trying to escape the castle. And then another time they go into a village, but instead of just grabbing the girl and taking her, they, 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 they pay the mother. Do they? Yeah, they throw coins on the ground. Oh. 
I don't even remember that. And and she's like, she's like, don't let them take me. She's like, you're, you're going to do fine in the Contessa's castle. Like, I mean, maybe, in all honesty, maybe the lady didn't know what was going to happen. Maybe she thought she was just going to be a servant. And, and she's like, ooh, cash. And she's like, ooh, I, this, this is more money than I've ever seen in my whole life. And then the girl's like, no, no. You're a very bad mother. <laughs> So the first virgin that we see is, is strung up on this like skull bathtub and and she slit down her wrist so it drains out into the bathtub and the Contessa is bathing in the blood for like you said what seems like an eternity. Yeah, this is this is uh, one of the many scenes where yeah it feels like the actors are like what am I supposed to be doing and it just keeps going. It 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 definitely feels like like a scene that is there to have that scene. Like, like nothing happens. Yeah. They spent a lot of time building this bathtub with the skull and, and rigging up the girl hanging there. And they spent a lot of time in that, making it. And then when it happened, there was, no, there was nothing other than just to establish that it was there and that's yeah. what she does. Yeah. So they just like kept filming. We zoom in, we zoom out. And that is this segment. There is there is literally no story as we know story. Yeah, there's no conflict. There's no motivation other than I'm gonna bathe in blood. Your your brain would say we've established this this like rural farm girl peasant character uh, who gets sold off by her mother to the the countess. And then we follow her little storyline, right? Yeah. Like, oh my God, like, uh, what's happening in this castle? This is crazy. Yeah, the Countess should not be the main character. That should no, be the, um, the, the antagonist. Yeah, and then she's like, you, you, we, got, we have to try to make an escape because she's just going to drain our blood and bathe in it. Mm -hmm. uh, one girl tries and fails. Uh-oh, that's an example. Let's not do that. Yeah. Uh, how about we all team up to try and kill the Countess or do something, and then, you know, oh, no, there's conflict. Conflict. Uh, conflict. Um, but no, these look like these look like poorly shot scenes for like the History Channel, like yeah. where they're filming like the real life story of uh, Beth Roy. Oh, Elizabeth Beth Roy. Yeah, yeah, where they're like, uh, where that's all it is. It's, yeah. There's no narrative to it. It's just scenes. And then, oh, the scene after that, she gets cleaned up and she's wearing like a gown, like kind of a see-throughish gown, but she still has blood on her face for some reason. And then she looks at herself in the mirror for 25 minutes. Yes, yes. Uh, and that's another zoom in, zoom out, zoom in, zoom out. And there's no rhyme or reason to the logic of the blood. The first scene makes sense because there's a literal bath. Yes. Uh, and then after that, the one that tried to escape, her punishment is being beheaded. <laughs> and then she says, I am going to swim in your blood. I will drink your blood and feed your headless body to the flames. And then they cut her head off and all the blood just spills all out on the ground. And we're like, we got to catch that blood in something. Go get a big, big, plastic tub <laughs> or a bucket. Catch that blood, it's going all over the floor. And then she takes the head. Mm -hmm. Oh then, yeah. Then we discover she has a room of decapitated heads. Yeah. Uh, and then she also does a couple of throat slits. Which look pretty good. The effect actually looked pretty good. Uh, and temporarily gets sprayed in the face with some blood, although it's quite the waste of virginal blood. I guess, yeah. You gotta put that shit in a bathtub <laughs> and you gotta soak in that. You gotta marinate yeah. in that virginal blood for hours if you want the therapeutic effects of it. <laughs> but the Contessa or Countess or whatever she is, her, her methodology is sporadic. It's inconsistent. And inconsistent at yeah. best. <laughs> She's wasting lots of virgin blood. There must be lots of virgins in Hungary. There won't be for long how wasteful she is. 
These girls have, uh, ought to start having sex really young in order to avoid the Contessa. My daughter is not a virgin. She's not a virgin. Yeah, of course she is. She's only 10. No, no, no. <laughs> Yesterday, she was with uh, a Subway Jared. <laughs> How dare you laugh at that? <laughs> You. you sick, <laughs> sick fuck. I'm gonna get you, you sick fuck! <laughs> How dare you laugh at that? <laughs> Here, come by to give it the foot long. This is what you've done to us, Glenn Danzig. <laughs> <laughs> this is what you've done to us. But there is that kind of cool shot when, I think it's on the back of the box even, where she's like, there's like a straight, like, you know, pool table or poker table lighting shooting down on her. And she's holding up a body, oh, remember? Yeah, yeah. And I, I don't know what she was doing. Like, I think, oh, she, she was cutting her stomach open. Yeah, but that's where she removes her heart and eats it. Yeah, yes, she eats her beating heart. Yes. And while she's still alive, yeah, all the dead people in this movie are constantly moving. You see their eyes twitching, they're breathing. Nobody can play dead. But yeah, it's one of those things where she pulls out this prop and somebody had taken the time making the prop. It has all the arteries connected to the, the proper th things. And it's beating. It's still beating. And then, and then she bites it. She's supposed to eat it, but the prop is just has a just off and on switch. <laughs> so it's just on. Yeah. And it just keeps beating. And the actress who's had the heart pulled out of her doesn't quite know what to do. No one told her to just die immediately yeah. when the heart comes out. But she's just like, <laughs> uh, uh, like, like she's being tortured. She doesn't know what to do because nobody told her. When the guy holds up the beating heart in Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, and then it, it's still beating while the guy's going down into the lava yeah. pit. And then as he starts on fire, the heart starts on fire. That's okay <laughs> that that heart is still beating out of his chest because there's, there's fucking voodoo magic involved, right? right. There's a ritual. Yeah. Uh, this, it's no one was told what to do. Yeah, that's the whole movie. And you could feel that. You yeah. could feel that awkwardness of the cameraman, the actresses, the prop guy is like, <laughs> it, uh, and Glenn Danzig, why doesn't this stop beating? I, it, you got to open it up and switch it off. You never told me to make it switch off after she pulled it out, after she took the first bite. You know, you never told me that. I don't, keep filming. I don't know what's going on. Just fade out. Just fade out. There's lots of fade outs at yeah. the end of every scene. Should I, should I be dead after she, she takes the heart out? I'm surprised that never happened, where like the actors were asking for direction, <laughs> like mid in the, take. In the shots of the movie. And it's just left in. Yeah. Am I, am, I dead? am I dying? It's like that part in Samurai Cop, going back to Samurai Cop again, where the guy's on fire and they try to put the blankets over him and he looks over at the camera to see if they're still rolling. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yes, it's that, it's that. <laughs> it's that wonderful, the craft, the craft, it's, it's perfect. But yeah, that's the only flaw. <laughs> is that this, the final act isn't isn't a, a tour de farce of of Glenn Danzig's greatest failures <laughs> in a final act that yeah. just hits a it's a home run yeah. you know it's a couple it's two home runs and then like a like a like a base hit <laughs> and that's that's what makes it not a great perfect super funny bad movie yeah because you don't end it on like a high note right. So what but else? Then, what well, else then, we, then we cut back to our Crypt Keeper, Bubarella, and, and she's like, that last segment had someone bathing in blood. Now look, I'm bathing in blood, but not really. Well, my darklings, after that one, I need to take five. And what could be more relaxing than a nice, long bath? My hands have some blood on them, look. I, when I th do we cut, Glenn? I think in his vision, he wanted her to, to sit in the bathtub of blood because they, they have the same set thing there, the yeah. same prop. But you um, gotta reuse that prop. And then, and then he envisioned her like sinking into a bath of blood and she said, I don't wanna do that. <laughs> so there's a, like, a, like a plastic bucket of blood off camera 
And then she says the line and makes me want to take a bath. And, and she dips her hands in it and goes, See? And, and then it's like, and everyone on set and all the crew members are like, that's it? Yeah. But what else happens? And, <laughs> and then they just wait. <laughs> and then the movie ends. And Glenn Danzig, Glenn Danzig didn't yell cut. So nope. they just kept rolling. He didn't yell cut. And then the, they run out of footage and then the credits start. <laughs> and that's the end of the film. Yeah. Veronica. Check it out. So that was Veronica. Yeah, you can order it on Blu-ray, or I guess it's on streaming too. Oh. The fuck is calling? I don't know, I thought everybody was dead. Landlines still work? Well, it's your turn. Okay. If it's a debt collector, I'm dead. Hello? Hello! It's me, Mr. Plinkett! I'm trapped in Tijuana! Mr. Plinkett, what are you doing in Tijuana? I went down to Mexico to get some of those chloroquin pills on the cheap, but they sold me a prescription for a bottle full of kitty litter! Um, I'm sorry, what do you want me to do about it? Jay, don't forget to wipe down the fucking phone when you're done! It won't let me cross the border, and oh god, no one's starting to develop a cross! <laughs> uh, uh, we can't help you, Mr. Plinkett. We boarded up your house. Bye, good luck! Hey, you know what the worst part of this whole coronavirus situation is? Uh, collapsing industries, possible depression, the staggering loss of life? No. It's that Glenn Danzig won't be able to make another movie for a long time. Now did you wipe down the fucking phone receiver properly? As instructed by the CDC manual? Not just the handle, but the receiver and the transmuter of the phone receiver. <laughs>